Sunday. We've got a good crowd. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. I hope you guys have a good good day as fathers. Uh, rejoice in your dads if you still have them. And, uh, tell them how much you love them. So uh, today we're going to talk about, the way I made the title is it's kind of an equation where you can set something equal to each other, greater than or less than. So if you're writing this, make sure you get that little greater than sign right. It's the, the bigger part is pointing toward the greater. So the title is Creator is Greater Than Creation. That's the theme I want to talk about. And I hope that we can all leave here just a little humbled uh, by this topic. You know, it is Father's Day. Let's talk about our Heavenly Father just for a little, little while today. I like that picture. I've used it a lot, you know, just to try to put into perspective how big God is. Well, what a, how much he's done. I want you to think for just a minute this morning about how, just how awesome everything is that God has created. And we really enjoy the things that God has made. We're going to go over a number of things in this lesson that men uh, delight themselves in uh, from the things that God has made. And it simply all points back to the creator, the one who made it and his greatness. We're going to talk a lot about uh, the beauties of nature. That God has uh, we'll talk about delicious foods that God has created for us to enjoy. I know some, some of us will like to talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about people who we love and we take enjoyment from that God created. He's the origin of all life, all people. We'll talk about animals. Right? Sue likes her pets. I wanted to get a picture of Sue and her dog, so I, I couldn't find one. Uh, we'll talk about the works of men's hands that are enjoyable to us, things that men have made, men have done, that we find enjoyment in. All these things in this world originated from the work of God's hand, uh, which he has given us to enjoy while we're here, and it's all part of his creation. So I, I love this topic. I love talking about his creation and the things that he's made. First Timothy chapter 6, and verse 17 says he's given us all things richly to enjoy. The whole point of all of this is Partially so you will enjoy them. God wanted you to enjoy these things while you're here. How great is our God. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turn. Right? God doesn't change. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 17. And sometimes we sing that song, This is my Father's world. It belongs to Him. Uh, you know, try to name one thing in your head that is on this earth, something that you enjoy or you take enjoyment from that did not come from the hand of God or originate. Is there anything? Is there anything that exists? Now, I'm certain that there's not a person in here who can name a single thing on that in that category because literally every single thing came from God. He's given us all things uh, on this planet. You think of something in the solar system. You think of something in this vast universe. It all came from the hand of God. Now, also think about this different thought here, but in regards to taking pleasure in his creation as human beings, he's not only given us the awesome creation, but he's also given us the means by which it's by which it is possible to enjoy the things of his creation. Now what am I talking about? Well think about this. What enjoyment could you get from that sunshine beaming down on us if we didn't have the sense of sight to be able to see it, or the sense of uh, touch to be able to feel that sunshine? How, what would it mean to you if you couldn't experience it? Could you delight yourself in the sunshine if it weren't for those senses? You know, what enjoyment would we get from our food? The great taste, you know, we love our food. Uh, if we were not able to smell it, taste it, feel that satisfaction of it going down into our stomachs and feeling that we're, we're filled with that food. How could we take pleasure in anything if God didn't give us the senses by which to experience the things which we can they wouldn't really mean much if we couldn't enjoy them. How could we take in the satisfaction of music or the songs that we've sung this morning? What would that mean? Or the sounds of nature, the sound of the rain this morning that was getting all over my shirt. I think it's dry by now. But, you know, if we weren't able to hear. You know, you, you, you think of something like a rock. You know, a rock is surrounded by all of the same glorious blessings that we are. It's on the same earth, but it has no way of taking them in. Has no senses by which to enjoy them. Has no mind to be able to comprehend what's around it. Has no sense of, of sight. It can't hear the awesome blessings. It can't see and smell those blessings, taste, touch, nothing. 
Think about that we were designed specifically by God to be able to experience all the things in the world around us. So yeah, these things are great, but think about that. You know, If it weren't for God, you wouldn't even be able to take in this creation. You wouldn't be able to enjoy it. So he's given you the creation and the means by which to enjoy it. He's given us five amazing senses in which we can encounter the world. We're not a rock. We're not an inanimate thing. We're a living, breathing, feeling uh, creation. So with all that in mind, how great our Creator is, let's just think in this lesson about the Creator versus the creation. Put the, you know, point number one, let's just ask the obvious question. Which is greater? I don't think that's a very hard question. Which one is worthy of greater praise? Something in the creation or the one who created it all? I think the answer we'll see is pretty obvious. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 16 in the Old Testament, Isaiah gives that famous comparison. Uh, between God and his creation. And he says, Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? Right? Can you put the potter and the clay on the same level as one another, as equals? He says, For shall the thing made say of him who made it, He did not make me. Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, He has no understanding. Right, that's kind of a funny picture if you think about what he's saying. We, we are being compared as the creation, as human beings, to a molded piece of clay. We wouldn't exist as we are if God didn't make us like that. And, and God is the one who molded us. He's the one who formed us. And I say that's a pretty accurate illustration, by the way. So picture a potter shaping a piece of clay and molding it into what he wants. And, and actually, my, my wife, Betty, she's a ceramics teacher, um, so I'm going to use one of her art pieces for this example right here. This is a ceramic cap uh, that Betty made. And yes, even Betty's artwork looks like a little brat. I don't know how, she, <laughs> how she's able to do that. I, I liked it. I thought it was pretty good. There's a little video on her making it. Maybe I could give you the YouTube link. But if, if this little brat ceramic cap could communicate to us, would it be able to look up at Betty and say, you did not. Or would it be able to look at Betty who made it and say, you have no understanding? That's what Isaiah is saying. You're not intelligent. Isaiah is pointing out how silly it is as human beings, the creation, uh, to try and rebel against God, to question his ways, to try to you know, belittle our mighty God and put ourselves, try to put us on the same level as God. Who are you, God? Why have you made me like this? Because obviously we have no place to be doing that. And hopefully you can leave this lesson knowing your place. That you're just a created thing. You know, and and we're, God is so much greater than us. And we need to bow down and worship Him for giving us everything. The Maker is by far greater than all that which is made. You know, no matter how great the created thing is or how great it becomes, it still points back to the fact that it was formed by a Maker. And it originated by something other than itself. That's something that would can be said about all creation. And if a creation didn't have a creator, it would not exist. Uh, that cute little cat wouldn't even exist if Betty didn't choose to make it. It was her choice. She decided to do it and, and make it. Therefore, what has been created needs to know its place in, in the grand scheme of things. You know, think of the great structures of the Egyptian pyramids, and the Sphinx, all those things that are so interesting. Now, we bestow great honor on these ancient monuments, don't we? Right? It's one of the wonders of the world. People travel far and wide just to come and get a glimpse of these structures in person. And maybe someday we get to go see those. Those are awesome. But as people uh, gaze upon these awesome structures, what sort of questions do you think are running through their minds? I'd say probably what they're all thinking is, who built this? How, how did they do it? How did they figure out how to move these great columns of stone, I tried to get a big picture, but these things are huge. Historians still have trouble figuring out how they moved these great uh, building blocks and got them into their place. How they did they build a ramp up there and slowly move it somehow? I, you know, we conclude these individuals who built this, they were pretty impressive. Right? It's amazing what they did. So as great as a created thing might be, it always points back to the glory of the creator and it falls fall short of the creator if it's a creation. You know, think about a painting. Oh, that painting's so beautiful. 
It's wonderful. It's magnificent. What's our conclusion? The painter must have had a lot of skill. Right? And that's what the Bible says. Same exact thing about the magnificent creation of our God. Psalm 19, verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork, right? The skies. It just tells you how great God is. We, we observe the creation, and it demonstrates to us how powerful, how creative, how impressive, how wise the God of this universe must be. You know, O oh Lord my God, when I am in awesome wonder, Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe is played. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Now think of a God um, who is mighty enough to create this vast universe. Just last night I watched a video and it was titled, uh, How Big Is Our God? I thought it was an interesting thing so I clicked on it and it, it it just kind of put into perspective how big the creation is. How far away we are from all the other things in this, and billions and billions of miles wide. You can't even, it's hard to explain how big the universe is and our God created it. So it points back to how, how mighty God is to be able to speak that into existence. Isaiah chapter 64 verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. And we are all the work of your hand. Uh, so that's the same thing. Listen to Hebrews chapter 3. It speaks of this theme as well. Chapter, uh, verses 3 through 4. The Hebrew writer in, in this section is in the midst of discussing why the New Testament is greater than the Old Testament. Why you should follow the New Testament. And one of his arguments we know is, is he's pointing out the difference between Moses, the mediator of the Old Testament, and Jesus Christ, the mediator of the New Testament. In talking about Christ, here's what he says, why you should listen to Christ, why you should follow him. He says, for this one, talking about Jesus, has been counted more worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. That's really neat. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. What's he saying about Jesus Christ? He is part of the divine Godhead crew created this whole universe. You can read John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and, and the Word was God. Without Him, not, no things were made that was made. You know, this is a great section that talks about Jesus' divine nature. What's his argument, though? Jesus is greater than this man, Moses, because Jesus is a member of the Godhead. He's the creator, and Moses is simply a created being. All right, so which would you rather follow? Which would you rather put your trust in? He's saying there's no comparison. There's no comparison between the creator and the creation. He who built the house has more honor than the house. So that's, what, that's the first point of this lesson. Point number two, I want to talk about idolatry and what idolatry really is. You know, if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We'll be there for a little bit. Romans chapter 1. As you're turning there, I'll make a few statements about the topic. I think it's true that something has to be number one in our lives. No matter who you are, if you're an atheist, if you believe in God, whatever your belief is, something has to take the number one spot. You know, many don't like to admit that, that something is number one on our priority list in, in our lives. You say, oh, I don't worship anything. I just kind of go with the flow. But when you stop and think about it, we all do. No matter who you are, if you don't believe in God, you worship something. Something has to be number one in your life. We have a great number of priorities, and oh, how true it is that something has to be number one. For some people, it's their job. Their job is their most prized thing in their life, the most important thing, and they put it in the number one spot over everything else. For some people, it's their family. Right? For, for others, maybe it's a hobby that they enjoy doing. They, they just place that over everything else. Hopefully, hopefully for us, it's God. And hopefully God is number one in our lives. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. He was talking about food and clothing and raiments that, that people worry about. He said, don't worry about those things. Put God first. Everything else will fall in place. Don't worry about your job. You'll get there. Just put God first and make him your number one priority. So God, throughout Scripture, has always commanded mankind to put him in the number one spot of their lives, always. 
pursue the Creator, to be worshipped, to be honored, to be sought after more than any other thing. You know, and I'd say that's fair, wouldn't you? Uh, for God to ask to be put in the number one spot of our lives. He's given us everything. Uh, he's given us the very life in our bodies. He's given us our families. He's given us the whole material universe. There's nothing that doesn't come from God. Therefore, I think it's a simple request. He gave you everything. Put him first. Any other, cre any other thing is simply a created thing. And why would we want to put something else in the number one spot of our lives? You know, you, put, you plug anything else into the spot of God, and you're pursuing the creation more than the creator or over the creator. And so, you know, when God is not first, our priorities are mixed up. We, we don't, we're not doing things right. We're not thinking correctly. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1 says, Remember now your creator in the days of your youth. Right? Don't forget God. Remember your Creator before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Seek God while you're young enough to do it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, God said to Israel, You shall have no other gods before me. Now it's interesting, it's interesting that he said that because we know there is no other God. There's no other life force out there. Right? The Bible teaches that. He says, Don't put any other gods before me. So I repeat the question. It doesn't have to be a, a person out there, but why would you pursue anything over the God of, of this universe in this life? Is anything in this world higher than God? Is anything more important, more magnificent, more powerful, wise, impressive? See, what idolatry essentially is, is when we worship something besides the Creator. If you stop and think about it, that's really what idolatry is. Anything else is not the Creator. There are two categories of things that can be worshipped in this life. Two categories. Number one, the creator. Number two is a creation. Is there anything else? I don't think there's anything else. You know, uh, one of those two categories will hold the number one spot in your life as a priority. And if you have placed anything, anything in the creation above the creator, you have become an idolatry. That's what idolatry is. You know, it's worshiping the building more than worshiping uh, the builder. It doesn't make sense. It's like giving more praise to the painting than to the painter. It doesn't make sense. It's putting the clay on a higher level than the potter. It doesn't make sense. So God said, you shall have no other God than one. So let's listen to what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through 25. Because he's talking about this very topic, about putting God first. And about, uh, he's talking about the ancient Gentiles and how they lived. So I'm just going to read this. It says, for since the creation of the world, right, since the, from the very beginning, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Right, so even though he's, it's invisible, they are clearly seen by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and divinity, so that they are without excuse. So Paul says here, man has no excuse. Right, we all clearly see God's existence by the things that are made. We see the painting, we know there's a painter. We see the building, we know there's a builder. We see, we see the creation, we know there's a creator. And so he says there's no excuse. Right? The fool has said in his heart there's no God, the Bible says. Verse 21 says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image of made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Right? What's that a reference to? As a reference to when they would make a little idol and bow down to it. Uh, we can read about that all through the Old Testament, Israel and the Gentiles, uh, idolatry. They would shape their little gods into a bird, or a cow or a man, or some other created thing. And they would bow down to it, and they would call it their God, uh, because they didn't want to worship the true God and submit to Him. Right? They, I want to put God, the real God over here. I'll make my own God and worship Him, because I don't want to do what the real God says. And there's accountability with the real God. Verse 24 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. Right? They didn't want the truth, that there's a real God in heaven, that there's one God in heaven who created everything. They set that truth aside to believe a lie. It says, and they worshipped and served the creature 
rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. If you take a theme verse away from this lesson, I want you to take Romans chapter 1, verse 25. They worship and they serve the creature rather than the Creator. You know, sometimes we look back at the idolatry in the Old Testament, both from the Jews and the Gentiles, and, and we think in our minds, oh, that's foolishness. Why? I, you know, I, I'm not that foolish. I would never do something like that. I would never worship a created thing and bow down to it more than the Creator, but why don't you think about that? You know, I would make the statement that I believe many people in the 21st century are more involved in idolatry than even these ancient as the ancient civilizations were. There's more idolatry today. We need to remember that idolatry isn't just building a little statue and bowing down to it. But idolatry is when we put anything ahead of our God as to worship it, as to bow down to it in our lives, more than God. God has to be in that number one spot. So putting a created thing in the number one spot of our lives. So point number three of this lesson, let me give you some things in the creation that men and women often pursue more than their creator and ways in which idolatry can be uh, shown in different ways. Ways in which we worship the creation more than we will worship and bow down to the actual creator. And I think you'll see that this happens a lot. So number one, I said we were going to talk about nature. Now, how many people in this world would rather go out and pursue the beauty of God's creation and nature rather than pursuing God himself and opening up his word in prayer, gathering with his people. How many people would rather be there this morning than here? I think there's a lot of people in this world. A lot of people would fall into that category. Maybe that's even what's in your heart. I'd rather be there. Maybe you might say, hopefully you want to be here, where we're actually focusing on the creator and not just the creation. So many individuals delight themselves, I'm one of them, in getting to spend time in the creation. You know, camping, canoeing, hiking, fishing, sightseeing, caving, swimming, bird watching, all these things. They love experiencing nature firsthand, but they have absolutely no desire to spend time with their Creator whatsoever. You know, they don't pray to God, they don't read His Word, they don't focus on Him or worship. In fact, they have no interest in getting to know more about God. They just want to play with His stuff. They just want to, they just want to enjoy what He's provided. You know, it's kind of like going to a friend's house when you were younger. You didn't really like the friend, you just thought he had a cool house. You know, I think that's the attitude of so many people that they have about God. They love this creation. Atheists love this world. This is so, it's such a fun place. It's so magnificent. It's so cool. And, you know, they love this creation, but they could care less about him. Less about, you know, thanking him. They're not thankful about it. First, or Romans chapter 1, verse 21 that we just read. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Nor were they thankful. They weren't thankful for these things that God created. So what a selfish thing to do, to take enjoyment from all these things and, and at the same time not praising Him and thanking Him for what He's done. All right, so that's something we can put over God in our lives. It's not wrong to enjoy the creation, but don't put it before God. Number two, food is something I think that you might even find would fall into this category as well. Food is something in the creation that men often delight in more than their own creator. Acts chapter 14 and verse 17. Nevertheless, God did not leave himself without witness, and that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. You know, I don't know if I've ever met a person who didn't like to eat food. You know, unless they were sick or couldn't eat food for some reason. Raise your hand in here if you find enjoyment in eating food. Please raise your hand. I better see your hands. I don't want, I don't want to preach a lesson on lying. <laughs> uh, people today will drive an hour and a half away, wait the 45-minute line to get into their favorite restaurant where they can eat their favorite food. You know, it seems to be America's favorite pastime. It's not necessarily anything wrong with that, eating good food. But how many of those <laughs> same Americans have that attitude about going to church and about opening up their Bible? about pursuing that time. You know, I'll, I'll drive as far as I need to go to get my great, you know, I love my Mexican food, whatever it is. Are you willing to have that same tenacity and determination to get to God, to pursue God, 
Sometimes people pursue food more than they pursue the creator of the food in this life, the provider. People today will delight themselves in eating ice cream cones or steaks or a burger or a salad, but they don't want any part of taking delight in the God of heaven, learning his ways or eating from his spiritual food. They just like the taste of the food. So that's something we can place in front of God. Number three, we take enjoyment in other people as part of the creation. And sometimes we'll even place people above the creator. You know, best friends, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, fathers, sons, mothers, daughters, grandparents, grandchildren. You know, it's Father's Day today. And, you know, people will travel far and wide to make sure that they, you know, they'll call their father or they'll be with their father, eat with him, make sure they give him the, the, the day of honor that he deserves. But they're not willing to do the same thing ever. For their Heavenly Father who gave them life. You know, there are so many people in this world who love others, who love people, just unconditionally. They love what God has made. They delight most of all in people. That might be you. you know, that they, they get the most happiness out of relationships with other people, with young people, old people. They just love people. So many are heartbroken if anything bad ever happens to a loved one. Yet, so many don't seek to praise God, who is the origin of all their loved ones. If it weren't for God, you know, do you realize that mother who you love so much would have never existed? Never existed. That those children that you love so much would have never existed. <coughs> so without God, that child that you love so much would, would have never been here. Therefore, we ought to be so thankful to God for all the people in our lives. And how he provides for them. We need to thank God. Thank you for taking care of my mother, and my father, my family, my wife. You know, if, if you love others, why would you not love God who created them and who's providing for them? So some people will put people other God, over God. Number four, you can talk about music. You can put a lot of things in this category. For many people, life would not be the same without their music. So many individuals find life so much more enjoyable because of, of music and songs and Cars and instruments, things like that. They'll listen to their songs on their phones and their iPads all day long, but they'll never seek to pursue God in His Word or in prayer. So they do that more than they try to take delight in God. I love music. I don't really care about reading God's Word. You talk about animals, right? So we can talk about <laughs> no. Um, people love their pets. People find enjoyment in caring about their pets and animals and paying for their pets. And many times people will even give animals a higher attention than they'll give the God of this universe. It really is true if you stop and think about it. Number six, how the works of men's hands. Things that men have created who we find, that we find enjoyment from. There's a lot of stuff that would fall into this category. Devices that have been invented that take a precedence over, over God. Games that people play, sports, you name it. You know, sometimes men and women get so wrapped up in our things and in the things that men have done that we neglect God who provided all of those foundational things. So how many ways there are that men can worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. It's idolatry in its clearest sense. It's, idolatry still exists today. And so, so certainly we need to acknowledge that there's nothing wrong and take an enjoyment from the things of God's creation. But the point is, we must put all these things into the proper perspective. Give, give them the proper priority in your life. Put God first. You know, how about we let all of these things that we enjoy so much convince us of the glory of our God and our Creator and how we ought to pursue Him. As we enjoy these gifts in our everyday lives, make sure we're putting Him first over all those things because He's given us all those things over our job over our money, over our hobby, over pleasures in this world. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, God says, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hands have made. My hand has made. And all those things exist, right? It's because of me that they all exist in the first place. What can you give to me that I didn't already give to you? Psalm 104, 24 and 25. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. This great and wide sea, he talks about the sea, in which are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great. 
Job chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, Job says, But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you, and the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or the fish of the sea will explain it to you. Who among these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Right? God is the reason behind all of these created things. And if you enjoy pursuing the things of the creation, how about you try the creator? He's greater than all these things. You know, if you put your hope only in the creation, that goodness isn't going to last forever. It comes from God, but he, he's told us, he's promised that that goodness is going to fade away, the physical. But if you put your hope in the provider, even long after these physical blessings are gone in this world and they've worn away, you will still have access to God and his blessing. Don't pursue the blessings. Pursue the giver of the blessing. Let me close with ten very quick reasons why God is greater than all things, than all created things. Number one, talked about it because he's created all things. Nothing would exist without him, therefore he's greater than every created thing. Number two, he is without origin. Everything else you can think of has an origin, has a beginning. And every physical thing that you can think of will have an end. But the Bible says in Revelation 22, verse 13, Jesus says, as a member of the divine Godhead, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and last. There is no, God is timely. Right, he's outside of it. Number three, why is he greater? His ways are higher than our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and uh, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Number four, he is independent. By that, I mean that God stands by himself. He is self-sufficient. He does not depend on anything or anybody to keep him alive. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 25, Paul said, Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. He doesn't need something to keep supporting him to live. Number five, he never changes. Malachi 3 and verse 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Hebrews 13 and verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? What, God, what sets God apart from all other things is that our God is a constant. We can count on him when everything else is changing in the world around us because he, he will be re as reliable tomorrow as he was yesterday and as he is today. Number six, he rules over time. 2 Peter 3, 8, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And in a thousand years is one day. God's not governed by time like we are. Everything that we know is harnessed around the clock and the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun. We get up and that's not God. God is outside of that. God's not in the time realm like we are. He's outside of time. He created time. Number seven, he is infinite in wisdom. He is infinite in goodness. He is infinite in power. Psalm 147 and verse 5 Great is our God, and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth and the riches of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And when we try to understand God's infinite ways, we can only touch the hem of the garment of what is in the mind of God, trying to understand them. Number 10, and lastly, in comparison to us, there's no comparison. God is holy, pure, undefiled, no sin, 100% uh, life. We cannot approach the God of this universe because we are all like an unclean thing. We've all fallen short of his glory, the Bible says. So all of these things, uh, amazing attributes, help describe for us who God is and why we should seek to worship him over any other created thing. And that's quite a resume. Right there. There's nothing that falls into that category like our God. He is the top of everything that is in existence. And he will continue to rule after all these things are gone. Psalm chapter 18, verse 3. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. Jeremiah 10, and verse 6. Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great, and your name is great in might. So that's the lesson. Hopefully... 
you will be able to catch a glimpse of just how much God is greater than us and the, uh, compared to anything that is created. Continue to love Him. Continue to pursue Him. Learn Him. And thank Him for everything He's done. If you're not a child of God today, a member of the divine God that came to earth 2,000 years ago, lived in a human body for 33 years, died on that cross. And you have to believe that message in order to go to heaven. The Bible says you have to hear that. You have to come into contact with that information before you can act on it and be forgiven of your sins. Secondly, you have to believe. You have to believe that it's true that Jesus did die on that cross. That he was the Son of God. He came down from the Almighty. Number three, you have to repent. That means an, an acknowledgement of my sinful ways, and I'm going to make a change of mine it's not perfection, it's faithfulness. I'm walking in a new direction uh, in the rest of my life. That's a repentance. And number four, confess him before men, and he will confess you before his Father and his holy angels. Number five, go down into that water and be baptized to wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. Rise up out of that water, having received all things, having for the forgiveness of sins, your salvation, your entrance into heaven. And then you come out of that new creature ready to remain faithful until death. Uh, he will give you the crown of life, Romans 2, verse 10. So if anybody needs to do that today, we can uh, do that for you. And if anybody else needs to come for prayers, please come while we stand and sing the invitation song.